Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And since we know that on-demand liquidity using the digital asset XRP is live in the Australian corridor, I think anytime something in the way of payments is occurring now in Australia, people really take notice. And this was a link that was sent to me by my friend Allie in Australia just yesterday. And she said it smells a lot like Ripple and XRP. So I did a little bit of a deep dive. And you can see that OSCO is a payments app and it is backed by BPay. BPay is owned by the four big banks in Australia. We first started to hear a little bit about them in September 2018. They were trying to really get a launch off and uh, well, they were a little bit slowed down because the two banks, ANZ or ANZ as they say down under and Westpac had some issues in getting their integration uh, done, but they have gone live now and this is a overlay service okay so the purpose of bringing this to your attention is really twofold to show you how they are thinking about expanding uh to overseas capabilities but also to explain that australia has this very unique npp it is the new play payments platform so with osco they can reach 42 million customers and this is a layer that sits on top of this npp it is a service that enables real-time payments via email or mobile phone numbers and the uh looking at this mpp it's it's really all inclusive it was developed by 13 financial institutions and so it supports lots of different options in the way of payments and you can see here that oscar will soon roll out the planned request to pay capability npp is also talking with both international payment fintechs and to swift about how it can support inbound payments from overseas whether they are intermediated by correspondent banks or other digital intermediaries. So I think you can say that there is a very good chance that Ripple technology can be put as an overlay on top of this play payments platform. It's really, really good to know. And just looking at the 13 financial institutions that built MPP, you can see ANZ, ASL, um, Bendigo, Citigroup, Casqual, uh, gosh, HSBC, ING, just lots, uh, lots of big names in the banking uh, industry. So I just really think it's great that this inclusive and open access for real-time payments platform is so real in Australia. And they are just not asleep at the wheel. Look at this graphic, which shows you kind of some of the happenings within the fintech landscape in Australia. And there's a lot going on. You can see that in blockchain, we've got the Ripple uh, logo here. But I want to look at this capital markets with FX, Flash FX. This is a company that's been a longtime partner of Ripple, and they have just announced that they are a user of the on demand liquidity and do use XRP for settlement. So, here on their website, they talk about this new payments platform, the MPP, and how it is limited at the time they wrote this to domestic Australian dollar payments. And yeah, he was just really talking about how they're at the mercy of expensive and slow payments and the infrastructure from the banks for their international remittances is still something that, uh, you know, is um, a big challenge. So using the innovative Ripple technology platform, Flash FX delivers extraordinary price transparency, fast, fast international settlement and transactional control to users, setting a new level of service standard and being able uh, to combine the powerful domestic Australians new payment platform, that would be the NPP, with our international remittance Ripple distributed ledger technology, powered flash fx infrastructure and will create an amazingly efficient fast and user-friendly global payments experience so that is kind of gives you an idea of what is happening in australia it looks very 
very much Ripple XRP friendly. Okay, so Flash FX. Well, there was an article that just came out on December 24th I want to look at because he is talking in a little bit more detail about using the on demand liquidity. So the CEO explained that Ripple's ODL technology needs some time to gain acceptance and establish itself as a competitor to SWIFT. So he's being very realistic here. And this was about two weeks ago that Ripple announced the launch of the on-demand liquidity corridor in partnership with Flash FX. And they do use the XRP token to gain liquidity. And the service provides an alternative for Australians who want to send a payment faster and cheaper than banks can currently provide. And Flash FX is the first Australian digital currency company to receive the Australian Financial Service License, or AFSL, from the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. So according to the Australian Transaction Reports and Analysis Centre, Australia processes 50 billion in cross-border payments annually. So the Flash FX CEO noted that the two companies, his company and Ripple, have been working together for four years. And he has always believed in Ripple and the benefits of XRP for his company. And the acceptance of XRP transactions and ODL was initially difficult, he said, that most companies preferred to the well-known and therefore still used Swift. That's the reality. It takes a long time to get people to change what they are comfortable for, even when they can save time and money. But it is coming because as he notes here that the ODL adoption, yes, may take some time, that it's not overnight that banks will jump on this. There's risk appetite and there's a number of different things from a regulatory perspective that they can do. But I think, you know, looking back on the last 12 or 18 months, it's improved continuously. So I like the way he is really not overhyping it and he is showing you that he uses it, he likes it, and it is getting better and better over the last 12 to 18 months. And finally, Flash FX is planning to expand their ODL service to Japan and they could take this step with the help of SBI. It, it is written in this article uh, and that will happen uh, probably in Q1 of 2020. Yeah, according to this interview. So, wow. I mean, yeah, we're getting there, everybody. We are getting there. I know it sometimes seems like this is a race with uh, the tortoise and the hare, but um, that tortoise just keeps moving forward. Okay, in Japan, well, this country is currently 18% cashless and uh, the national target is to go 40 percent cashless in five years and the tokyo governor this is koike san you can see her here she has stated that tokyo is actually going to achieve a higher goal they are going to aim at 50 percent so from january uh, to february this 2020 they're going to issue a new reward system with points and it'll be very interesting because they're going to tie it in with a prepaid um, digital currency like point system with the card we use PASMO for uh, getting on and off transportation, taxis, buses, trains. Actually, we can use it in um, the convenience stores and uh, actually, actually a lot of things that are around uh, vending machines, coin lockers. Anyway, it's used for lots of different things. Everybody has one. I have multiple cards. Um, yeah, it's just, gosh, it's, 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 it's the way to pass through the train system here. So they are going to first uh, provide these points in the way of what 25 million yen is going to be the campaign to start for the first two months, along with 47 different department stores in Tokyo. So you can 
you can get these points by staggering your commute time. It's so interesting because commute time on the trains here in Tokyo is pretty tight. It's pretty crowded. So they're going to encourage companies to allow uh, their employees to stagger commute times. I think this is really great concept and also the reduction of shopping bags. So if you are going to buy an official um, carry bag and and choose to say no to plastic bags, uh, that is another way that you can gain points in this system. I like it. I really like it. it it's going to be fun to follow. And I think Leonidas was the first person I saw that listed this. I'm not quite sure, but it came out a couple of days ago, and now it's all over the news today in Japan. And that is there's a solutions architect with IBM who's still presently at IBM, has been in that position for about two years and nine months. He has uh, put on his uh, LinkedIn page that he was performing proof of concept on RippleNet blockchain implementation for bank and interacting with various teams and client to gather information and drive various solutions. It looks like it was being done for a new app called Yono app. And it is a, it is something that the uh, SBI, the State Bank of India is behind. And so I don't think we should be so surprised and I'll tell you why. If you take a look at who is leading the blockchain um, adoption with IBM, and especially when he, um, this is J Jason Kelly, when he spoke to CNBC this last summer, the general manager of blockchain services of IBM said that they were looking to collaborate with anyone moving into blockchain, no matter their focus. And he says that blockchain is a team sport and he's ready to work with other companies, including Facebook. And he sees it that we're all just on the same team and we want to score a goal and he wants to help these projects come to fruition. So however they weave it together, there is data at the center and whether it's regulators or platforms or what have you, uh, he, he wants to break down these, um, these infighting uh, that is sometimes found within uh, the technology. And I will show you here, this is the really great November 26th interview. It's short, only two minutes and 55 seconds long where he talks about how he is really one to want to collaborate and he has this openness to work with anybody. So I am just not surprised to see that the IBM um, employee was doing a proof of concept with RippleNet. Yeah, just not surprising at all for me. All right, now I'm going to put a link to this in the description below and I don't think I'm going to be in trouble for that. You know that there are a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space on YouTube that are um, being penalized with strikes and videos being taken down and um, gosh, you know, privileges being lost and, and risk of losing their channels and we don't know exactly for sure. There is Jake Chervinsky, and he says that he's guessing that YouTube crypto crackdown has to do with the potential violations of the Securities Act 17B. It's an anti-touting provision which requires promoters of securities to disclose any compensation they receive for their promotion. And he says, I'm surprised it took this long, honestly. Well, he's just guessing because we don't know. And I will tell you that what happened to me a couple of times in this last month, and it was something I shared with the people on the backside of Twitter through some direct messages. I'm um, in the zoo um, group, and I asked if anyone else in the zoo was having the same trouble because for the, it hasn't happened to me for about two weeks, but about three times this last month, I had some of my um, videos uh, not demonetized, but 
put in kind of a holding pattern. They turned the green monetization symbol to a yellow a dollar sign, which means that there is something in the video that uh, is not uh, agreeable with all advertisers and therefore it wouldn't be monetized. And I, of course, couldn't figure that out because I hadn't changed any of my format. I hadn't changed the way I talk about um, this space. So I immediately appealed and I actually got a hold of someone in the chat. And that person told me that, and, and this is part of YouTube, told me that the uh, launch of some new algorithms were put into place and that it wasn't perfect in the beginning because it was a, a technology that was learning. So it was, you know, one of those technologies that would get uh, more intelligent and it would learn as it went along and that they were really sorry that the uh, algorithms looked like it was causing a few people some trouble and and just be patient and someone will manually check your video and then should it be okay it will then get monetized now the three times that it happened to me the monetization one time took more than a couple of days one time it took just a couple of hours and another time it changed to being monetized within like five minutes. So I think it's getting smarter. I think I don't have that problem anymore, but uh, all I can speak from is my own personal experience. So I just don't know why these YouTube channels are having trouble. Um, I hope it's not something uh, more than just a glitch in the algorithms and that those people who did receive strikes get that um, retracted. And yeah, it's a little concerning. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm watching what's happening because, uh, yeah, I, I just enjoy this and I would hate to see my channel disappear. So I'm going to be as careful as I can and, and follow the rules. And that's, you know, the best I can do. Okay, everybody, I want to just bring out the attention of someone who is, I think, very, very special. And this is a principal software engineer at Ripple. I learned that there's a, a women's conference for uh, technology happening in Santa Clara that is in the Bay Area of San Francisco on May 4th and 5th and there are just some amazing women from the technology industry from Apple Netflix Oracle Adobe LinkedIn IBM Facebook Google Uber Amazon Disney eBay and Ripple and check out Amanda Amanda is leader uh, in blockchain and cryptocurrency-based technology for the company Ripple. And she was the chief architect of Huawei Pay for their device in the U.S. and principal architect roles she held at Apple and PayPal. Well, I just, you know, the, the, um, the talent that Ripple is able to garner for their um, growth is just always amazing me. So Amanda has been working in the tech industry in the Bay Area since 2000, and she has always been passionate about building world-class software products for mobile payments, mobile advertising, e-commerce, using cloud, big data, AI, ML, uh, microserve technologies. And she is the co-chair of AnitaB.org Software Engineering Committee and was a member of Leadership Committee of Women at Apple and the eBay Woman in Technology. So she is, wow. She's also an avid ballet dancer. So I just, you, you, you just have to really pay attention to who is behind this company, Ripple, and getting the digital asset XRP out there in a use case that is going to change the world. And then the people who just say that Ripple or XRP is a scam, I, and then you read the kind of people that are working for them. It's just, they are looking sillier and sillier by the day when they say that. Okay, everybody, I'm jumping to the fluff. So we just learned what children age 7 to 14 in Asia want to be when they grow up. And I just, I just love this. So you can see Japan, the number one 
job that people want to be uh, or business person. What business person is, is an office worker. That's what that means, is an office worker. Number two was teacher. Number three was doctor. In Korea, number one is a doctor, then entertainer. And third is police officer. Taiwan, teacher ranks number one. And Singapore, teacher. And Vietnam, doctor. But look at how many teachers and police officers. And if it's not a police officer, it's a singer, actor, or entertainer. <laughs> Hong Kong, doctor, teacher, performer. Thailand, doctor, pro athlete, and a chef. Whoa, I'm happy to see the chef. So when we look at why kids in Japan want to be an office worker, well, sometimes you might have images of this. And yes, you still see this as representing the office workers of Japan. Everybody looks quite the same in terms of their bag, their shoes, the color of their suit, <laughs> their ties, their hair color. There's not a whole lot of uh, style going on or individual personality. However, that is truly, truly changing. So I have been here for uh, just about 20 years and I have really seen a difference and a change. And yes, people do now show a little bit more individual style. And this is an example of people who are actually going to work in jeans now in Japan. So it won't, it's not that crazy to see. And no, not all offices look like this, <laughs> although some still do. This open office environment is still the majority. It is still the majority. I don't know if, if I can tell you honestly that they're this messy, but well, <laughs> they're a little messier than, than the offices you might see in the United States. I don't know what that is all about, but anyway, that's maybe another, another fluff. But I do tell you that um, it's changing. And this is an example of some conceptual offices that are being done in Japan. And here is one that is for real. This is the uh, fashion um, leader retailer Zozo Town, and they are really changing the way uh, the office environment is. And this is a picture of their of their office and it's quite nice. I love all of the plants. So it is happening everybody, but I think there's one thing in terms of change that will not change anytime soon. And this is my business tip for you if you ever come to Japan. And that is when you do hand over your business card, by all means, hand it over, turned so that the font or typeface is facing the person correctly so that they can read it and use two hands. Always don't break that rule. Okay, everybody do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.